colonial ideology had been one of the natives need the assistance and even the rule of colonial powers to bring them into civilized existence, to lift them from barbarism and show them the path to civilization. Now, in the end, with the end of those colonial empires, you were going to have instead a modernizing mission, sort of stripped of the obvious um, prejudices and biases of civilized versus barbaric, and implemented not through colonial imperial power structures, but through the new international institutions um, of the UN and the post-World War II era. So <clears throat> that's the thesis, I believe, of this chapter. Development is sort of born as a coherent policy prescription and as an ideology because it met the needs of this particular conjuncture. It appeared to resolve multiple concerns and logics simultaneously. So firstly, there's a humanitarian concern. There are people dying of diseases that are preventable. It's only right from a humanitarian standpoint to do things to help avoid those deaths. To, you know, in some cases it's spray DDT, but to control diseases that were killing large numbers of people and keeping life expectancy short was a sort of humanitarian imperative. There were geopolitical considerations, as I mentioned, um, Fewer people on this logic would mean less poverty, the idea being that there would be more to go around, or rather, with fewer people, each person could have a greater share of the economic pie. Less poverty would in turn reduce instability and help to combat communism. There was an economic imperative, which comes out clearly in a passage he cites, um, the Connolly cites, the, the thought that the peoples of the third world, poor developing world, um, would be healthier and they could therefore be more hardworking and active participants in market economic activity. And then finally there was a sort of complicated ethical and racial problem because some of the countries in Europe at this time were, were actively encouraging their own populations to have more kids out of a fear that they were getting outnumbered by other countries. So France is very worried about the population of Germany because of the long history of wars between those two countries and they want to encourage the French to have more kids, you know, to grow the population in order to keep up with Germany. They also at one point suggest that um, 13 million Germans should be forced to leave Germany and go someplace else to diminish the population of Germany. Um, but at the same time, there seem to be concerns that if you advocate that same kind of policy of encouraging births in the former colonies, um, you will be seen as a blatant hypocrite, um, imposing a double standard in which your people are supposed to grow more numerous, but their people are not. And this was um, a grave concern. You know, how, how do you pull this off, especially in the context of international bodies like the United Nations? So development as the idea of growing prosperity was a way of addressing, or at least appearing to address, these, all of these concerns simultaneously. You could say, no, what we want is for everybody to get better off, and that will naturally lead to a decline in fertility and therefore a stabilization of population, and we'll solve all these problems without getting us caught up in um, ethical problems or geopolitical problems. We can go ahead and spray DDT and cut down on malaria and so forth um, without having to worry that we are um, increasing the numbers of our potential future enemies. Are there any questions? Okay. So as he says on page 122, there was no alternative but to assist development in order to reduce birth rates. So the politics of this were extremely complicated, and most of the chapter um, details how these politics played out um, through the 1950s. And I'm not expecting you to memorize all of the details of what happened at which meetings and who got upset by who else and that kind of thing. But it is worth, I think, recognizing and getting a handle on the array of players, the, com the complexity of these politics as they played out over the course of the decade, right? So in the first instance, you have these United Nations agencies, such as the World Health Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and, the, and UNESCO, which was the Education, Science, and Culture Organization, if I remember the abbreviation correctly. And they're all faced with this sort of question of how to define population itself, or rather, where does population fall among these bureaucratic organizations that are all just getting set up, right? They're in their initial stages. Of of defining themselves, hiring staff, developing programs, and deciding where they fit um, with each other, and then also um, with relation to UN, the UN and various member governments. So should population be considered as a question of food and agriculture, and therefore housed under FAO? Some people would say yes, because they would say the problems of, of population are basically a function of the relative availability of food, and that a growing population requires increasing food production, and that's one way to deal with the problem and prevent starvation, famine, other kinds of problems. Much of the effort was ch channeled early on through the World Health Organization, or there were hopes that it would be channeled through the World Health Organization, treating population principally as a medical issue. And here, the logic had to do with birth control, abortion, um, to some degree also recognizing that it, overpopulation might express itself in the form of disease, right? So if you've got a UN program intended to uh, provide clean water because that's a way of addressing medical issues, um, that might in turn have effects on population. And if you're concerned about population, therefore, it's properly seen as a medical problem that should be treated through who? On the other hand, there are people who said, no, this is actually an educational issue, because what we need is to give these people knowledge and information about birth control and about family planning and help them understand that it's in their own interest to have smaller families and that there are ways to do that that are different and more effective from whatever ways they may have been familiar with before. So you might imagine a population program being channeled through UNESCO. Meanwhile, there's powerful, wealthy American foundations who are also prominent players in this. And if you read all of Connolly, the importance of the Rockefeller Foundation is extraordinary. It's there from the beginning, all the way through Connolly's story. And it, it's, it's sort of... I guess, I guess we see this today. You're, you can imagine this in terms of like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? They, they not only have a lot of money to give away, but they're extremely prominent in sort of the circles of high society and government and the economy. They have a kind of authority that is carried in the people who lead these foundations and have set them up and provided them the money. And they are free to um, move around and pick and choose among their issues and in many ways set policy by identifying issues, defining issues, giving money to certain people or institutions to fight those issues. And it ends up having a significant effect on the, the larger world sort of agenda. And directly or indirectly on government policy. So, I mean, these foundations do this to this day. They, they commission a study, and that study then is issued, and people pay attention to it because it comes from a prominent foundation. They give some money to address the issues that they've raised and studied, and the next thing you know, there are other programs, government programs, that are also going after the same problems. And um, in this case, members of the Rockefeller family itself, who were uh, prominent leaders on the, in the foundation, um, could sort of travel around the world and see whatever they saw and decide that something was important and then channel significant amounts of money into it. And that's exactly what happened in the case of population. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation um, just had an ongoing and persistent and very significant effect on the kinds of opportunities that were available for demographers, activists, um, various professionals to uh, get up and actually do things about these problems.
There were not also other um, nonprofits or non-governmental organizations um, by Planned Parenthood Federation here, I should note. I don't mean that there was only one or that this was only the one. It was a federation, right? It was actually an umbrella for Planned Parenthood um, efforts in a whole bunch of different countries. So there are lots and lots and lots of different groups that are operating under this umbrella. There's uh, ongoing politics about exactly what their sort of over, overarching or unifying mission is and how to define it. Um, but it's a prominent way for certain kinds of uh, players in this, in this struggle to assert themselves and get involved and do things. And then finally, their governments. And by governments, I would include, in this case, the Vatican. Now, what happens in this struggle, if you read the chapter and actually were able to keep a sense of the forest for all of the trees? Anybody remember? What's the outcome by the end of this chapter? Is it who wins at the end of this chapter? The people who are concerned about overpopulation or the people who are fighting against the people who are concerned about overpopulation? I don't blame you if it's not clear because I honestly couldn't have told you that for the first time I read the chapter either. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Basically, the opponents of population control win this round of the struggle. The United Nations ends up not really committing significant resources to this effort and instead issuing statements to the effect of, well, you know, this is an issue and if member states want to get concerned about it and do things about it, then they're more than welcome to do so, but we are not going to make it an official part of the programs of the World Health Organization, that sort of thing. And why is that? How does this play out relative to Cold War politics, according to Connolly? Is this just another Cold War battle between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, waged by proxies? I realize it's almost spring break. Uh, maybe this will be the last question before spring break. Anybody remember? He says, he says you basically can't make sense of this in terms of Cold War, the simple Cold, Cold War duality or, or polarity. It's, it's, it, it, in fact, cuts back across the sort of standard alliances and um, expectations of Cold War politics in, to such a degree that um, you really can't make sense of it that way, right? Yeah. Yes. The, the same year that the Soviet Union legalized abortion, was, they also um, basically sided with the Catholic Church in fighting about this issue, right? So the Catholic Church and countries with large Catholic populations um, agitated very strongly against population control, um, specifically if it involved birth control and abortion, right? And we've seen that birth control um, is far and away the most effective way to reduce population growth, right? Um, the, so, but some of these countries were in the Soviet bloc. Some of them were not. Um, some of them were rich. Some of them were poor. The politics were such that, you know, the sort of ethical and moral arguments um, didn't align in any kind of neat or tidy way with the bigger political commitments of communism versus capitalism, or East versus West. Um, and what you got at the end of the day was sort of a whole bunch of different players that um, fought for specific components of this, you know, there were some people who were fighting for population control because they were eugenicists and they wanted to see control on the number of non-white people who were going to be born in the succeeding generations, right? But they weren't, they could strike an alliance with the people promoting birth control for um, the betterment of women, for example, but they weren't hard and fast allies. They were allies of convenience, so to speak. Um, so at the end of the day, in this round of the battle, you didn't get a strong commitment from the United Nations to undertake population control in a systematic fashion. Some other way forward would have to emerge later. So that's the take-home message of this chapter, and you can, in subsequent chapters, when we come back to Connolly in a few weeks, you, we will learn more about how this played out. Okay, a couple more slides and then we'll break. I want to draw attention here to Alfred Sauvy, uh, a French demographer who comes up twice in the course of this chapter, maybe more, uh, but there are two instances that I want to draw your attention to. The first was that in 1949, he insisted that the term world population made no sense because there was no world government or even the requisite sense of solidarity that might support it. Sauvy was a very prominent demographer and his opinions mattered to people, but, it, but he was essentially speaking up and saying, sure, there is a number of humans in the world, but there isn't a world population. That the, for population to be a meaningful category, there would have to be some sense in which it functions as a single population. And his argument was, no, it doesn't. There are subunits, countries, for example, whose population sort of function, you can imagine a government that could have a policy that could you know, affect that population, but that there was no such thing as world population. And I find that an important point to draw out in light of some of the things that are coming up later about pairing capacity. And then, in 1952, according to Connolly, he coins the term third world. And this catches on and becomes the term that we are familiar with now, capitalized, right? He suggested that um, this, this third world was not the East, not the Soviet bloc, and not the West, not the U.S. and its allies, but the South. It was the poor countries of the South, and that they were trapped in a cycle of misery in which population growth and poverty were mutually reinforcing. And Connolly suggests that this uh, designation of the third world not only stuck in a sort of geopolitical discursive sense, and it is, it is actually interesting that we still call it the third world, even though the second world um, now no longer exists, right? The first world was the U.S. and its allies, the second world was the Soviet bloc, the third world was everyone else. And now there's no second world, but we still call it the third world. Um, Conley draws the point out, and he suggests that, in fact, Soviet's designation of this third world was a deeply conservative move. He says, proponents of population control were pushing an idea more radical than national self-determination and assisted development. They insisted that everyone had the same right and the same duty to plan their families. By rationalizing and redirecting reproduction, they could make their people modern in a single generation. This is the advice being given to the heads of state of the third world. In other words, there's been a key reversal, right? Initially, the idea was, as you get more affluent, fertility rates will fall. And therefore, we should encourage affluence, encourage development, modernization, in order to induce a reduction in fertility, because we don't want overpopulation in these poor countries. By the end of this, Connolly is suggesting that the proponents of population control have actually reversed that equation and concluded that you can reduce fertility rates and thereby induce modernization. You can cause modernization, or at least cause a reduction in poverty, by reducing fertility rates. And this is a really important move to make, because it thereby follows that development can be pursued through reductions in fertility, programs aimed directly at reducing fertility. And this is essentially what we're going to see happening in the chapters later on in the book. Are there any questions? All right, now we're going to break for five minutes.
Okay. I want to, uh, I want to look more closely for the remainder of this lecture at the concept of carrying capacity. Um, any idea why these two pictures both appear on the websites of state game and fish or natural resources departments? And in fact, you can find variations on the same figure at the websites of many other state game and fish departments. What are they getting at? No hunters in the audience, I take it. Yeah? yeah? This is about hunting. This is carrying capacity used as a way of explaining to the public that hunting is not only fine, but is in fact an important part of maintaining wildlife populations. You get an annual production of wildlife coming in, these pipes or gutters, that uh, fill this uh, barrel or water tank, which it could be equated to sort of the environment, um, but it overflows the environment. There are more than the environment can contain, and it results in the loss of population in various fashions. Starvation, accidents, pollution, old age, disease, predation. And then here, the Arizona one actually provides a little spigot out of the predation um, threat or cause of death for hunting. The idea is um, hunters are simply taking part of the surplus, and they will not reduce the overall number in the long term. Yeah? Uh, this one I found today, this one I found a couple years ago, and has since been replaced on the Michigan site by a variation on the same thing. Now, this is not a very prevalent use of carrying capacity, but it is interesting that if you run a Google Images search, you find a lot of these. Um, and this is one use of carrying capacity, and it actually is quite an old one. It's actually older than its use in debates about human population. Um, and it's an important tool in the politics of hunting, because, of course, there are those who would say there shouldn't be any hunting, and this is uh, a prominent way in which the hunting community explains that it actually is biologically sensible for there to be hunting, um, at least in a controlled fashion. Um, but I put it up there to illustrate the diversity of uses to which carrying capacity can be put. Now, I'm guilty here of talking about my own research, so forgive me. But carrying capacity does not appear in Malthus. It dates to the 1840s, but it was not used in a Malthusian sense until the 1940s. Its origins are elsewhere. We can loosely say that it's the maximum or optimal amount of a thing or organism that can be conveyed or supported by some encompassing thing or place, but that's a huge ugly mouth mouthful, mouthful and doesn't particularly help us. Um, its core attributes, if you look at its uses over time, are that it's idealist. There is a sort of ideal carrying capacity that you can just attribute to something in terms of how much of something it can support. It's static. The ideal is that you will arrive at a number that is somehow fixed, and it's numerical or quantitative. And this runs through the uses of it in four different areas. First, as an engineered attribute of a man-made system or, or thing. And this is where it begins. And we now think of it mainly as payload rather than carrying capacity.